by MFSB, The Sound of Philadelphia. And, and I'm, I'm very glad to say the stand-up philosopher, the storyteller, is back. Hello. Where, where have you been? What are you doing? Uh, we're living in Bude at the moment, um, just because we can, um, in a small holiday let, which is wonderful. Um, there's so much more weather in North Cornwall. Like twice as much. Twice as much weather. Yep. yep, that's right. You can hear the sea roaring from about three miles away. It's wonderful. So that's what we're doing. And we're back in Exeter for... We did the Story Club uh, yesterday evening, which was incredibly well attended, about 35 people. We totally filled the monks' room. And on Saturday, we've got a show, which is St. Catherine's Priory at 7 o'clock in the evening. It's an all-ages show. So the show is called Love Struck. It's um, romantic stories. These, this is going to be suitable for adults and children, but the adults and the children will laugh at different bits because that's the way it should be. And it is in St. Catherine's Priory, which is next to the Big Morrisons or, uh, and on St. Catherine's Road, um, the kind of poslo area, that bit that nobody really knows whether it's Poslo or Mincing Lake. Um, and it's a beautiful little building if you've never seen it. It's worth it to come and see, the, to come for that alone. And we'll be there from seven and telling till about nine. Um, so please come along um, and it's all our favourite romantic stories um, so some of them are scary all of them are camp um, most of them are silly um, and we'll be pulling love in strangely odd directions for two hours that sounds wonderful thank you yeah we, we like it it's our favourite to be honest with you we always do a Valentine show and a Halloween show um, but we always prefer the Valentine show it's our top favourite show of the year so please come along um, if nothing else because we'd love to see you so people could just turn up oh yeah please do just turn up we're not really saying we don't do tickets in advance because St Catherine doesn't work that way and we don't work that way but if you can read, I mean, you can say you're coming there's a Facebook event um, called Love Struck uh, hosted by Widsith and Dior yeah I'm afraid so uh, W-I-D-S-I-T-H Widsith and Dior um, uh, and the show is called Love Struck and you can just book your ticket in, ticket in advance or simply show up um, yeah we're doing it again in Barnstable the next week um, and that will be just after Halloween and it's a bit later Halloween. so not Halloween um, whatever it is Valentine's Day you can see why I, see why I'm living <laughs> imbued I got a bit confused these days yeah anyway right uh, but that will definitely be the adult version the Barnstable one the Barnstable one is the adult version that's right so he's changed two or three of the stories and it's strange actually the children's version is much funnier because um, you have to think about your language and that actually makes it much much more funny um, and the adult version is a little bit more scary okay because that's the way it works more scary yeah adult version is more scary because we're prepared to go scary for adults in a way we do but what you I'm prepared to go scary for kids if I've only got kids because kids don't mind being scared and they'll miss the real nasties anyway uh, the, the bit the, always the problem if you're a storyteller is if you've got a mixed audience if you've got adults and children because they get scared at different bits and then they feed off each other it's very yes, strange yes. it's really strange yes. so we separate them so um, on Saturday in Exeter we're doing the all, uh, all ages right but if you made your way to Barnstable it would be a slightly different show and when, when is the Barnstable one again? The Barnstable is in uh, St Anne's, so that is in the Ploughs um, Annex in uh, Barnstable. It's worth going to support the Plough, by the way, because they're in a bit of difficulty. Um, uh, and that will be a week on Saturday, so that's the 15th. Right. And I think that's at 8. But. Right. And what are, you, what are you planning sort of over the, over the summer when you when you well, leave your your Bude Lair? <coughs> Bude Lair, we, we leave that mid March, so um, we will then be uh, just doing our final prep or for festivals for the summer because festivals start April May and we'll be in England doing festivals from May to August and while we still can because it will still be plausible, we'll go and do our French tour again because it might be the last time we can for September, October and November. Right. So how much of that time do you think it'll be in Exeter? Oh, well, off and on. We always come back to Exeter. It's one of our places we're always around in. We're doing the Respect, hopefully, anyway. There's a, yes, we, yeah, yes. So we're doing the Respect Festival, which is the beginning of June. So we'll certainly be here for that. And there are one or two other events we'll certainly be doing in Exeter. And obviously we're always here once a month because we host Story Club. 
So right, that makes that makes sense. So you, so that's that's a sort of fixture. It's a fixture, and we're doing. I know, for instance, at the beginning of April, we're doing stuff uh, with Mincing Lake Community. Uh, Mincing Lake was it Poslo? I can never tell them apart. Anyway, in the Mincing Lake Park, uh, we're doing storytelling there for um, Easter. So we're doing Easter shows in Exeter. The, the street arts festival is is that actually happening this year well, i don't know i don't know if it was happening this year we, we've heard nothing oh. and i haven't i haven't prodded yet to find out whether it was happening but if that does happen you'd, you'd probably be part of it probably um oh I, i'm I, i'm looking ever so slightly wistful here because i'd rather be doing shambhala but we'll see <laughs> <laughs> okay well so it depends how the dates fit it depends how the dates fit yeah yeah and it depends when um, when also there are about three things we do when we're in France and some of them are in for quite early September so uh, well two of them are in early September so it will depend on when they are this year right. so there's all kinds of things I, I kind of work out what we're doing but I don't know that yet okay okay but so so it's possible that you you could you could be on this show in this time slot on a Thursday once a month. Oh oh absolutely absolutely if you could bear me yeah, yeah absolutely definitely. absolutely I could always be here. Yes. Well this is what this is what I'm trying to work out. Yeah absolutely yes. we are always always uh, within I mean yes uh, unless we're not in the country or dead or at a festival or at Glastonbury we are we do story club because we love doing story club one of the things I love about story club one of the things that happened yesterday was a whole new lot of tellers started to tell for the first time and it's always a bit of a mixed bag but it's wonderful um, uh, which made it a very magical atmosphere um, and we love doing that we love having a, the you, kind you of environment explain again that there's the carrot barton so it's the carrot barton inn it is the first Wednesday of each month, um, so that is on Carrick Lane, I think. Um, and it, we are in the monks' room, so we're in the haunted room, and we have an or a storytelling. So stories are under fifteen minutes long. They are always oral, so you're not allowed to read. Um, and they are most people will be working in something like an oral tradition so it will sound like a conventional story but it doesn't have to be you can come and tell a joke people were telling life experiences yesterday and sometimes that really works well that's great so from, from my point of view to, just for new listeners just to explain that i i I've met you just sort of crossing over the shows. Yes, that's right. That's this, right. I used this, to do the show earlier. This time slot that, that you, you've had been doing. Yep, that's um, right. The start of the Wild Show, which is usually around about 10 o'clock. That's right, yep. Um, so I've started to come in early just covering, which I've done in the summertime, previous years. Um, but I'm now just trying to work out what, what, what we can do over the summer, let's say. And it's it's sounding as if it's, it's going to work... Um, Hang on. Oh, I'm sorry. I've got the, this one not sounding quite quite right. I've got the wrong wrong microphone. It's on mic three. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm am I'm, I'm sorry. I'll start again. No, I think I think I've been been heard. Maybe. Um, Otherwise, they'll yeah. just have been hearing me. And that yeah, been yes. Fun. Well, that's that's all right. No. <laughs> Disembodied voice. We'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it goes along. Yeah. Um, this is what this is the trouble of worrying too much about the uh, the questions and not noticing where the where the microphone is. Um, JD will arrive for the world show. That that will be quite all right. We'll have an actual producer. But anyway, coming back to it for this show, um, I can get in a bit early. I'm not guaranteed to be here at eight o'clock, but I'm probably nine o'clock soon after. So I'm either going to do um, bits and pieces that I've found, or else once a month you you can be here. Yeah, I'll be here once a month. Absolutely. So I think I think that's a good. I think I can tell a story once a month if you like. Yes, no, that'd be excellent. Okay, yeah, absolutely. I'd that, love to that, do that. that. That would work very well. And also, there's um, quite a lot of your work is on YouTube. Yes, well, you've recorded it over the years. I've, I've recorded <laughs> some of it, but you've uploaded a lot of it. As yeah, well. we've uploaded a lot of it, but your still sound better. Your sound quality is better than ours. But yes, uh, there is quite a lot of stuff with Widget and D or uh, storytelling. Yeah. And I, I think the the Wits of Deal Theatre, the TP, in quite a lot of situations, is you have quite a few guests. Oh yeah, there's, yes. there's a lot of people turn up, so yeah, I, I could try and track down some of them. Okay, that would be and, wonderful. And find out what else is going on. Okay, that would be, that would be brilliant. Yeah, yeah, no, that would be good. So that that would fit fit, fit in with that. So the the other thing I wanted to, to to check with you is is your attitude to what I would call Creative Commons or reuse, remixing. 
Um, the oh, you know the I con- have a very strong line on this one. Well, yeah, but would you just repeat it? So, so my clear. absolutely strong line is that every story belongs to the comic. It really does belong. Well, certainly all storytellers' stories. I'm not going to annoy all the poets out there and all the poets in Christendom. Um, all storytelling stories are never owned. Um, and every story in telling will put their own spin on it. So you can't own Cupid and Psyche. But Cupid and Psyche is Beauty and the Beast. And Cupid and Psyche is every single rom-com that has ever been. They're all Cupid and Psyche. So if you start saying, I'm going to copyright Cupid and Psyche, uh, goodbye all fairy stories. It's just stupid. Um, but the other thing, I'm, I'm actually much... I have a very strong line on because I come from the kind of the Exeter storytelling world uh, uh, where we all rip each other's styles off. So I'm, I'm even quite open about people ripping off each other I, when you're sitting there watching people story tell you're thinking I'm not just going to have that story I'm going to I'm going to have the way you're putting your intonations in but why I'm gentle and why I'm relaxed on that is because it's an oral tradition well the thing you won't rip off is their diction because actually everybody na- natively if you're telling a story and trying to think of what you tell next you actually have your own pattern your own set of words you use right and so the words i use and the words of somebody who i shamelessly rip off because she's absolutely wonderful called roz um who comes to a story club um and she rips me off but it's uh, the words she uses are always different in spite of the fact we're heavily influencing each other's styles of storytelling right because just simply because my vocabulary is different so it's kind of very odd being a storyteller because I am absolutely opposed to all copyright under all circumstance and it doesn't make any sense. But that's partly because I'm massively defended because the words I use and the words are not, and even my, story to, even my partner, even my wife, the words she uses are different. We use different words because we're different. We have slightly different vocabularies. Right. So anyway, so yeah, so, copy everything right. all the time. Right, well that's, uh, that sounds great. But I just wanted to make, make that clear. But as long as it's in the oral tradition, it's different if you're writing, of course. Uh, well, what about drama? So a drama, a dramatic performance, is that, is that an oral tradition? Or do, do, do you work from a script? Do you make it up as you go along? Most actors will be working from a script. So how do you regard a script, then? Is that... Uh, well, the, 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 what sort of script are we talking about? I mean, obviously, Shakespeare is not... Um, is, is Creative Commons... Um, if you are ripping off Pinter and claiming it's yours, that would be slightly problematic. Yes. Um, because it would be, if you're doing dumb waiter, everybody would know that it was a dumb waiter. So you'd get caught. So you'd get caught. Um, but if you said, at what point would a dumb waiter become... So a dumb waiter is two hitmen waiting to kill somebody, and then in the end, one of them is actually the target. That's a dumb waiter. But I could probably find you a folk story where that was actually happened as well if I look hard enough. So you could tell it in your own so way. So I could tell it in my own way. Or, w- more realistically, if I was telling a dark story about two people, I would be telling the story and thinking about the dumb waiter as I told the story. Yes. Um, because it would be informing the way. I, I don't know the dumb waiter. I haven't learnt it. But I, but I know what happens in it and I know how one character breaks down. So if I'm thinking about how one character breaks down under stress and becomes um, realises that they're the target and it's a study in paranoia, I would always be thinking about the dumb waiter. And I would feel no compulsion about that. I might just merely tell you that I was influenced by it at the end. Well, that's fair enough. Because it's storytelling. That's fair enough. Um, and what else is art? I mean, that's the point of it, isn't it? Uh, what, sharing things yeah. and re- yeah, re- recreating. Recreating. The point of art, is, uh, if it, art, art that's about ownership strikes me as a very silly, silly thing. You have all kinds of people doing all kinds of rubbish because you can't value it that way. It's valued by its sharing. It's not valued by its ownership. Well, I'd, yes, I, I agree with that completely. Yeah, because, I mean, that's one of the reasons we have the modern art establishment that we have. You think? So, so there are very good modern artists, OK? But I've seen Adam as everything. I know that an awful lot of it is really just genuinely bidded up as a confidence trick for investment's sake. And that's because it's owned. <laughs> <laughs> and that is really what yeah, happens. Uh, I mean, that, yes. not, that, there are wonderful <laughs> artists out there, okay? Absolutely. And not all modern artists like that. Absolutely not. All those caveats are true, but some of it is. Some of it is, yes. And uh, quite a lot of the stuff that pays for that, that is worth a lot of money, actually is. Uh, yes. Because it's made by the people who own the galleries. Because it's owned. Well, I think, yeah, once you get into the gallery situation, that's obviously what they're, they're doing, yeah. trying to do, yeah. you would think. So, would. Oh, there's a pressure there. But there's anyway. a pressure. There's a pressure there. Well, as soon as you put the ownership in and say, I must own that, you've, you've, problem- you've compromised the art. But anyway, 
I'm but, a storyteller. I would think that. Yes, but look, I'm, I want to move, move, move on because um, well, we could just go into the wild show if, if you're happy. If you're happy to stay, we might. We I may. can stay till about quarter past ten. I've got a dog to take to the vet. Okay. Well, we might. We'll start the wild show a bit late then. Okay. If that's the case. That's, that's, if that's okay. If that's all right with you. Um, so. The next thing I wanted to ask you about was situated knowledge. The, re- the reason for this is that I've, I've come across um, through Twitter a, a book and a meeting which was about designing uh, the transformation of situated knowledge. And I, I couldn't work out what they meant by situated knowledge. So I thought I'd ask you in your mode as stand-up philosopher okay. what so, that might be. So that would pr- I, I, I would suspect that's practical knowledge um, going into a bit of theoretical. So it's how you translate a theory into practical knowledge and build up practical experience of the world. And its contrast would be something like abstract knowledge, which is theoretical. So would maths come... Maths, when most, coming? a lot of subjects could have two aspects. Certainly there is applied mathematics and that would all be situationist. And there is a pure mathematics and that is all abstract. And maths has that division. Um, something more interesting would be, well, just as interesting would be, and um, my old subject, anthropology. At what point does an anthrop- can an anthropologist make abstract pronouncements about the nature of human society based on uh, their knowledge of individual situations? Because the entire discipline of anthropology has always been very... So anthropology is a study of cultures. You go in, you go and live with the people, you go and live with the people for a long time, about two to three years, and then you come off and write something about them. Okay. And what you write about them will vary a bit about how you understand where knowledge is. So if you're an existential philosopher, you'll write about the nature of humanity based on my life with the, with the peoples of Northwest Africa. Or if you are a practical human being, you'll write about the practical problems of living in Northwest Africa and the impact of colonialism on a, on a belief system or a practical system and anthropology would go between all of them okay. so the situation in situation knowledge is one extreme down that anthropological spectrum it's looking at how knowledge is used in the day to day how it is applied and then maybe a little bit what you can deduce from its immediate set of implications Right. So a situation, somebody who is anthropologist, who is doing situationist anthropology, would be invariably talking about liberation struggles and probably problems of um, post-colonial problems. about So how other cultures are impinging on existing face-to-face, existing indigenous culture. So that would be situated. That would be situated. That's right. And an abstract knowledge would be sitting, would be Levi Strauss writing about humanity being dis- resolvable into about seven opposites. Okay, okay, but that's more where the universities are at. Which oh is yeah, that, yes, yeah. So, so, well, it's one of the places. It was one of the places they fantasise themselves as being. I think I'll put it that way. Well, in the in the tweet, there's reference to mystery. That there's a, a mystery around the universities or the campus. Okay, okay. Yeah, well, yes, perhaps you could probably have that. There, there, there is a. If you've got. <laughs> Once you try to understand things through abstract codes, then you create a necessary language and you can only let the initiates in. It's standard anthropology, isn't it? Uh, so, you, I'm so for instance, me. <laughs> um, uh, one of the ways you can, in, one of the ways every group works is that you would create a language, if you're, particularly if you're an abstract group, so you're not really talking about the reality. I could use a very pithy political example, but I'm not allowed to, but can you just imagine it? So yeah. suppose you've invented a creed or a doctrine that is a little bit divorced from reality. Mm-hmm. It's been known. You could mm-hmm. be a university or you could be anything. Then you, then in order to defend it against reality, it tends to develop its own set of languages, codes and way um, and jargon. Right. Okay. So it's coding the world in its own little way. Yeah. And that will necessarily be to the likes of the rest of us who sit there going, what? They believe that? They say that? A total mystery. Mm. And it doesn't really matter. I mean, certainly the universities does that. Certainly the BBC do that. Certainly various political movements do that. Mm. Well, uh, and would we count them all as fortresses? Yes, well, let, well for, the fortress thing is what, what, what I want to get on to because that's one of the situations or dramas that I'd like you to consider over the next year or so. Okay. 
um, just just for new listeners, because I've I've gone on about this pre- previously, but there's um, a, 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 an idea of a fortress university, which was part of a lecture by Peter Horrocks um, in Durham a couple of years ago, when he was vice chancellor of the Open University, and was putting far too much money into Future Learn, um, or some would say. Um, because he, he did have to resign. There was so, there was so much um, criticism of that, that policy. But he was saying that he thought existing universities were more like a fortress university. And he did compare it to the BBC. I'm interested in what, what you say about linking the BBC into this fortress situation. Yeah, well, the BBC is a classic example. It, would, it likes to defend itself and its own identity against the world. But, I mean, any cult is like that. So, I mean, I, the point is, political parties and political movements are like that. They will create their own little universes. Um, and the problem always is with that is uh, not doing that. <laughs> um, so I'll give you an example. I'm allowed to talk about this one. So I do lots of stuff for some stuff. I've been a bit quiet recently with Extinction Rebellion. And now Extinction Rebellion, we have a way of understanding the world, which is based on science, like the fact that we have about this year to really start reducing carbon reduction, because if we don't do it incredibly quickly, um, well, don't bother making pension provision, um, because it's that serious. Um, so, but if you are in XI, so Extinction Rebellion, and you've kind of gone through the science, and you've gone through the, the, the actual fact that it makes you incredibly depressed, you, there's a great temptation to stay with them, and then you could be Fortress XR. Mm-hmm. And part of the problem is we do regular marches. We're doing one on Saturday, actually. Yep, Saturday. Uh, 10.30, in case you wanted to come. About time. It would be wonderful. Please be there. Um, the uh, is You have to go out and meet people who haven't gone through this all the time otherwise you get very insular and very cut off from the world so it's not just universities that do that although I mean in my life I have been very hard on universities because they all the time right (laughs) really all um, and it's a huge problem but the BBC does it but even uh, dear old XR who's got this mission statement to go out and talk to people can do it and has to force itself and it does because it's a noble organisation not to do it Right, okay. Um, so I think I, I'm suspicious of the phrase fortress university because we really probably ought to just say fortress thought. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, and fortress thought is a way of thinking in the face of a, of a modern world where there's just too much going on or it's frankly too scary or to engage with one bit of it you necessarily tear yourself away from the reality of the rest of it fortress thinking is always a danger because once you're in a fortress thinking it's hard to talk to and explain the world to other people because you don't and you can just not need to and what makes a fortress university more that makes that of course dangerous for xr because the world will end and dangerous for universities because they in the end they uh lose they vanish up their own irrelevancy <laughs> which is important if you're taking billions of public funding um same with the bbc um uh it's slightly different but it is the same base problem mm. it's just the universities take public money and do it so to just come coming back to the sort of detail of what I was thinking of over the next six months or so. If if we found a ruined castle somewhere, uh, or somebody else found a ruined castle and had the same same idea, um, you you could, as the stand up philosopher, uh, comment about it, 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 it's as if this was the remains of a university. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, it would be a very good image for the remains of all sorts of institutions. And all sorts of ways of thinking, actually. So that would be one. Yes, yeah, absolutely. One Ru- ruined museum. If we can find ourselves a ruined museum, where we can we can create a wonderful installation. <laughs> well, a ruined museum. We haven't mentioned museums yet, but I, I was just thinking of. Yeah, but, but, but museums are fortresses of knowledge. If you think about it, that yes. Uh, so it, could, it would apply to a museum as well. It would apply to a museum as well. If you, think, if, you, if you think about it, they've got big walls, yes. and you go in and you get screaming, and they're just a, for- a fortress of knowledge. Yes, OK. Well, we can, we, can work it, we can work it like that. I mean, I'm thinking particularly of, of the way things are moving online, because I'm, I'm just amazed how much money is still being spent on the campus on student accommodation 
on the sort of bricks and mortar real estate approach to what a university is. Yeah, well, it's what a university has. Money. The, the, I mean, but 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 my, my my point is that they could be spending money on on say future loan. The, the fact that Peter Horrocks yeah, yeah. was trying to do that but the, and didn't didn't get anywhere. But it really. fails to well, okay. That's the bit the, that's the bit where I will wax incredibly cynical. Okay, um, because yes, uh, the fortress thinking I think is everybody fortress thinks to a bit, and universities certainly do it. But the university then uses that fortress thinking to justify a lot of public money, and the two go together. Um, so anything that undermines their their own kind of integrity, it would not be money well spent for them. Do you know what I mean? So well, they, they have to be their own unity. They have to be their own thing. We are this university. But it, it, if you look at online platforms, they, they've, they've got a creative aspect to them. They, they will result in employment. There's a public good there. Yeah. There's all kinds of arguments could be made for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. They're probably good for knowledge, but that's none of the university's business. Oh, not. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. Um, it, its business is to survive. <laughs> and you don't survive by making knowledge endlessly dem- democratic if you're a university. It's so you think they're, more, they're more interested in selection and accreditation yeah. and, and the correct selection and they they're in, they do what universities do. No, oh. um, and what universities do is, I mean, traditionally what they did was educate the clergy. Um, yes. And there's a little bit of the university that is still educating the clergy. The fact that they're not really educating clergy and it's really rather more complicated than that and all kinds of things have happened. Why would they ever bother catching up? That's what universities do. They educate the clergy. Um, but now it's social scientists and therapists and media people. Can you tell them apart, Will? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should invite them all into the show and, and ask justify them. why I think they're probably the same. Um, they're kind of the modern clergy. Oh, if you think about it. I mean, I'll give you a silly old, stupid example, but one that cause it cuts the other way. Um, my, I have a. Uh, oh god a very complicated relative who has recently died so he's my brother's partner's husband I'm not even sure I should be able to tell you with my anthropological hat on exactly what my relative relation is but he recently died under somewhat odd circumstances um, and it was very interesting just before um, because he disappeared um, my great uh, now I haven't believed in God for more years than I care to possibly mention but the only sensible way of responding to that kind of situation is prayer because actually it's how else do you mitigate all your feelings about hoping it's going to be okay being worried about your brother and your sheer distance from the relationship Mm. so prayer is a very sensible way to navigate that social relation and without prayer you're going to need an awful lot of social scientists and counsellors and educators and modern woke speak (laughs) in order to do what prayer did rather neatly so I actually tend to think that uh, and that and so the clergy and whoever (laughs) universities are educating are the same people really no so the, the the clergy can carry on the clergy can carry on in just different forms actually prayer is for a very sensible way of dealing with very complicated social situations with or without god because it understands something very deep about humanity right okay. i've got very far from fortress uh, university sorry will no that's all right no no but you 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 you're still, I think you're still on track as what they're about. What they're about, yes. Yeah, so uh, because, because undoubtedly, the, the, the medieval universities, the, the, the clergy was a large part of what the, what they were doing. That's what they were doing, clergy and, law, and then lawyers. This is what the other thing they were then training. By the by, the times of Oliver Cromwell, they were. If you were, you would read law in universities, and then you go off to the, in a temple. But. Well, the the other thing I wanted to ask you about because I've I've been thinking that that actually the. Well, at least as, as far as online learning is going, it, the, the, the debate's getting more complicated. I think the, the fortress is breaking down a bit and maybe future learning is better thought of now than it was Yeah, I think it is. No, I, I mean, I do think that is the case. I think it, and it will gradually break down. Um, and one of the, I, I'm plugging it because I'm always plugging it. XR is one of the things it does is it actually go out and educate people about what is happening. 
So what sort of techniques are, is, are, are they considering? So them? on XR, there is various groups which put in connection, can put you in connection with the actual people who are doing the science on environmental change. And if you are getting together an educational package and wanting to um, have a meeting in a church hall, which XR do a lot of, in a community centre, you can run it past the scientists who've done the research. Right. Literally, you can run it. You can, they, they can be contacted and they will go through your figures and tell you what is true and what isn't true and what is not a, what would be an outrageous claim, 8.5 degrees isn't going to happen. And what is not an outrageous claim, 4 degrees will kill you. <laughs> and, that, and, they, right. and they will go through all the models and all the statistics. Right. And, how, and if you're actually quite good at maths, you can, they will give you the full lowdown. And if you're not so good at maths, it will, it will be filtered down a little bit, but only a little bit. So... There's, there's still an emphasis then on, on public meetings, on, on face-to-face events. There's still a... Well, you can do it. You don't have to do it that way. I, you, I was giving you a, an example. Thing about thing about public meetings is public meetings are still a very good way for base-level outreach. Right. Um, or, uh, I mean, I like the street myself, but the street can be very, very brutal because people will go in and people will go out and they won't listen very much. So I like the street... Um, but if you're not going to do the street and you want a little bit of defence, then a public meeting is a good thing. Right. Um, because people are used to public meetings, they'll drift in, they'll come in to listen. But you're still, you're still using social media. But you're using social it's, media. In support of it. You're using a lot of social media in support of it. And you can do it. I mean, if you wanted to find out about XR, there certainly are websites and all the XR websites. You can do it all online and all the facts, but uh, most of the facts, I'm going to make a very big claim. Um, if the facts have not been che- will will at some point be checked by the relevant scientists in the fields. Right. So that would be an example of a huge exercise in public education being done that kind of totally subverts universities and creates this situation where knowledge is going out, trying to go out into the world. Right. And one of the protests I do with XR is scientists for XR. I do just uh, uh, grunt... um, event organisation for them so we all go, so they all dress up in their white coats and we go out and forcefully educate the people and stop traffic to do it right because we're saying look these facts matter <laughs> we ain't going to let you ignore them yes. You're, we're going to break into your fortress <laughs> because if you don't uh, carbon dioxide will yes the the, um, the the last thing I wanted to ask you about is uh, a sort of rom-com version of this situation because if we're going to go for a ruined fortress as our metaphor it's a bit gloomy it's a bit um, dystopian so I was thinking something a bit more positive that maybe comes back to Love Struck um, which would be a campus that had evolved as part of a blended learning situation so all the social media would coexist with the bricks and mortar um, but there would be various... Uh, there would be huge problems with etiquette. Etiquette? Yeah, about, about, about who went to where. <laughs> well, yes, it might be the etiquette. I mean, I was thinking, you know, the romantic misunderstandings or... Yeah, of, of, of what... such things Jane Austen is born. OK. But why is the, so Jane Austen is the first generation of... You could, you're beginning to get... You could call them middle classes if you want, but they're a group of people who didn't used to have money who now have money. Right. And a slightly wider society. And they literally have to invent a new way of thinking about manners. Right. And Jane Austen is part of that invention of a modern manners. And it starts off with comedy because that was the way to think about it. OK. Well, the, uh, the, that's, that sounds fine because there's enough examples of people rearranging Jane Austen. Uh, the, it's, it's, there's no copyright problem. There's no there. copyright problem, no. Oh, that's, that's going to be fine. <laughs> that's that's absolutely. So, we'll retell Emma. <laughs> So we'll would be a one to do. Um, I was thinking St. Luke's, St. Luke's would be quite a good venue because you you could move over into the Waitrose Cafe, okay, as well, okay, which is a sort of another world, slightly different world, not entirely different world, but uh, well, is this to film it? Well, I think we should film it. In okay, the, in the oh. summertime, the all lighting right, will be will be fine. Okay, all right, yes, okay, yes, okay, we'll film it. We'll do it. We'll so do we'll, it. we'll do all of that. Now we'll there's people it. waving at me through the window. So if you if you'd be prepared to stay another ten minutes, you could meet the start of the wild show. Uh, when I, we've got a proper producer, and so no, I, no, I, you've got to go. I really have a I have an aged Springer Spaniel to be oh, taken to the vets. Okay, um, but look, I think we've it's sta- nothing serious, by the way. Just in case you're worried about my Springer Spaniel, he's just got his boosters, but he does need them. Okay, 
But look, I think we've established a, a method of working for the summer. We'll, Absolutely, I'd love um, to do it, Will. And we'll, 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 we'll worry about the autumn when we get there. Yeah. But we've got, we've got a way forward. Brilliant. I'd love to do it. Okay. Well, this is one, this is one chat which I know you use in some of your shows. And th- thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. Bye. Bye.